well. I'd like to open, reopen our meeting. Um, <clears throat> it's November 15th, 7 o'clock. This is the Lee Select Board meeting. Um, our first order of business, we have uh, open session minutes from our November 1st meeting. Do I have a motion for approval? So moved. I'll second that. Um, any discussion on the minutes? And hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Next order of business, we have a public hearing um, for that we've continued from the from our October 18th meeting for a special permit application for canna provisions. Um, I have it's like the per the application, the postings. Um, is anybody from Canna here? Would you guys like to speak to anything at this point? Uh, no, but yeah. Okay. On December sixth. So, um, yeah, if there's nothing further, I'd ask for a motion to continue the public hearing at our um, December 6th meeting. Mr. Chairman, I'll make a motion to continue the Canada Provisions Manufacturing Special Permit hearing until December 6, 2022 at 7 o'clock here in the courtroom. Is there a second? I second on this. Mm, I'll second. Then you second, sure. Did you want to read that? Well, it all, we only have to vote anyway. You yeah. don't even have to vote on this. Um, right. And if there's nothing further on the special permit hearing for can of provisions, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, and we'll be abstaining, Bob. Oh, one yeah. abstention. Yeah. Next order of business, um, we have public comments. Anyone? would like to make a comment please come forward Kathy right. Hall, Lee Youth Commission just want to say that now that the cold weather is here we're bundling up and we're getting ready to uh, think about setting up the ice skating so um, we will make sure that that's on Facebook when we're seeking volunteers to help us the actual uh, structure itself is supposed to only take 60 minutes um, my big concern is how long it's going to take us to put the liner down because it's 60 feet by 100 feet and if there's a little bit of wind that's going to be <laughs> and we will um, coordinate everything with the fire department because they are very generous with community service they come down and they fill up that little space for us and we should be good to go by the winter break so hopefully okay. yeah okay thank you but in the meantime stay warm <laughs> <laughs> thank you Kat. um any other public comments i don't see any hands on our zoom here so i will continue on we're now going to move into uh general business yeah let me try that other view here Yeah, so um, general business. Next we have um, sweet grass. Oh, let's pull that up. But we have a, a sweet grass discussion that we started last meeting. <clears throat> um, this is a discussion about a proposed administrative change to the permit. Now, it's my understanding the planning board, I have a letter here, met with uh, the sweet grass um, people yesterday and they voted four to one in favor to approve the minor amendment to the site plan and the site that's the site plan dated october 14th 2022 for the property located at 635 laurel street to be submitted to the select board that's the letter i have from them um looks, looks like we have jesse Je on the screen jess, who's yeah. with who, who's on the for BCAC, so yeah, you know, so we can get. Um... So I don't know if uh, if 
if you want to speak to anything, Jesse, or um, if Pete D'Agostino, I thought I saw him on there. But Jesse's the next item on the agenda. That's oh, why I'm I was sorry. mentioning it. Yeah, I'm we sorry. want to bring up Pete. Sorry. Yeah, Pete. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear Here me? Go. Yes. Good evening. All right. Um, so I, I guess we'll do, if it's appropriate, Mr. Chairman, we'll just jump into it. We had met with the select board at the last meeting. Um, there was some discussion uh, relative to the planning board having a further opportunity to review the um, MassDOT access permit and the, cor the corresponding work related to that permit. That occurred last night, as you previously indicated, the board uh, took a vote as, as they sent, uh, communicated to the, to the select board for this evening. So um, we're, the full team is here, more, most specifically Dan Delaney, who is a vice president at Fossil O'Neill, as well as um, the engineer record for the project and a traffic engineer. Um, so he's here to answer any questions. I believe some members of the select board were able to attend the planning board meeting last night. So. Just in the sake of efficiency, I'm, I'm happy to turn it over with any other questions. There's no changes from what we presented to the select board at the last meeting, and there's no changes from what we discussed with the planning board last night. I appreciate that, Pete. Um, a minutes here from their meeting as well. <clears throat> I suppose um, I would, uh, if there's I'd entertain a motion at this point for approval of uh, of the um, the minor site change. The minor, where's my agenda exactly here? There we go. Um, yeah, the administrative change to the permit, um, and then we can discuss it further. Yeah, well, it also um, disclose the rule of necessity That's right. before we start debate. Right. <clears throat> um, so as uh, as Chris mentioned, we uh, we will invoke the rule of necessity for the discussion and vote on the amendment to the sweetgrass permit um, for the following reasons: uh, Town Code 199.13.4 states that a special permit requires a unanimous vote of a three-member board, which we are. Town Code 199-9.11 states that cannabis permits must be granted by the select board. Uh, our member Jones uh, has disclosed in writing, according to Mass General Law 268A, Section 23, that he is an employee at a cannabis establishment in the town. Um, and therefore, this is no... There, uh, there are no other means to hear this permit amendment without invoking the rule of necessity because we need a unanimous vote. Um, so we're going to be doing that at this point. Um, so yeah, I'd ask for I'd ask for comments from the board. Is, is there an opportunity for public comment further on this? Um, this not being a public hearing, it's not a tip. It's not typical. But if you have a, a comment that you would like to make, uh, I'd, I'd allow it. Uh, Eric Williams, I am COO and an owner at Canna Provisions. Um, and I know that this comes before you as an administrative change. Um, seems to be just run of the mill administrative change. I did. Um, want to come and address this board at this time. Um, I don't think that this is just a slight administrative change, um, considering everything that uh, this application went through and including a very contentious public hearing to begin with. Um, I don't think this is a straight up administrative change. This is involving two towns um, and a whole bunch of neighbors and a whole bunch of concerns. Um, I did want to express that um, given the way I saw in the past, when there was a public hearing, I spoke neither in favor nor against this application. Um, I did provide a wealth of information to a, um, several members of the then select board on this matter, um, including real data 
um, that was also provided to the police chief and pretty much anyone who was asking for it. Um, as you'll recall, the police chief was opposed to this application for those reasons. Um, and I wanted to stress that I don't think this is just an administrative change. And frankly, I think that the board made a very big mistake when they granted the special permit and when they didn't listen to the police chief, first and foremost, but also to all the neighbors on the Lee side, as well as the direct neighbors on the Lennox side who had grave concerns about this. The other problem that I had and what brought me to bring this up today is this community. And we have been great corporate citizens to this community. You're very involved. We've been great employees. Um, we've come before this board so many times, answered any questions that have ever come along. We've also negotiated in really good faith with the town of Lee, with all of the community impact fees that have come through. However, in recent months, we have had um, multiple times that the principals of this facility um, have smeared our reputation to other business owners throughout the Berkshires, not just in Lee. Um, and for that reason, I wanted to stand before you and defend our reputation, tell you that I don't think that this is just an administrative change, that this is a unique opportunity for you guys to really consider or reconsider what was, I believe, a very bad decision to begin with. And I think that you should also take into consideration the types of persons who this company, um, um, it, who, who run this company, because those persons have been smearing our reputation and not just to other businesses within this community, but also on my personal Facebook page as well. I think it's unacceptable and there's no way that I would let this pass without me standing before this board and publicly and stating that I do oppose this, this application for all the reasons that were put forth in the first special hearing, for all of the reasons that the police chief also opposed this. And that's what I want to say. Thank you, Thank you Eric. Can I, can I say something? Yes, Kathy. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. I was at that planning board meeting yesterday and I questioned, they talked about, and I hope I'm not getting confused with something else, but I do have my little notes from yesterday. The something about the DOT got involved in the entrance and exit, but it was a verbal communication. The planning board never got anything in writing. So I question that, that decisions are being made without seeing something in writing because in the future things can change and say, well, yeah, I said that or I did that. So I question that. And then, and then the other thing that I question is, why is this company, they want our okay from Lee, but they're gonna talk to Lennox after. I think the conversation should still be Lee and Lennox as it was right at the beginning. And they're gonna put up something like planters or something to, to separate the property and do something later on with storage. So I'm just like, I'm confused as to why there isn't something in writing from the DOT and I'm confused as why there isn't still some type of conversation going on with Lennox before anything is decided on this entrance and exit on a very busy street. And they said something about it's not busy in the morning. Well, I've gone on that street at eight, nine o'clock in the morning and it is busy. There's plenty of cars on that roadway. All right, thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Um, yeah, I'll reopen it back up to the board if you guys have any comments or concerns for the applicants here. Well, first, uh, just to clarify a couple things, Kathy, I'm free for, to settle your mind on two issues. We do have a yeah. letter in so writing from say. DOT stating <clears throat> what they wanted for um, ingress and egress onto Route 20. So, so it is in writing and there's a plan with a date, uh, but I had some questions for the applicant also concerning how this went about. Um, and I know they have uh, a representative from Fuss and O'Neill and perhaps I can aim my uh, questions to that individual. Um, <clears throat> and also I will acknowledge that I, at the time of this special permit application, I was a, uh, an alternate on the planning board 
and I actually, because it was a conflict of interest there, I actually sat on the original planning board hearing. So I was there to listen to some of this. So I guess my question for... Um, I think it's Dan Delaney. Yeah, Dan, Dan, right? uh, Dan Delaney, yep. Mr. Delaney. Yeah, thank you very much for being here. Um, I know that uh, you folks went for some kind of an adjustment to, or, or you said it was for an access permit. And um, prior to coming to the planning board, I, I did have a question as to why that wasn't done before you came to the planning board instead of afterwards, and your original permit from the select board. I know that my assumption is if um, the restaurant had been sold to another uh, restaurant owner, that they probably would not have gone to DOT for anything. They would have just used the same curb cuts they always did. That it, Would that be a correct assumption on my part? Typically it's the change in use that drives it, sir. Okay, that, that's, I kind of thought probably, but so if this was a change to it. And you, to answer, oh yeah. sorry, I don't oh, want to interrupt. No. To answer the first question, yeah. we, in this, there are, a lot of cases, and this is one of them, where we we don't apply to the DOT for the DOT permit until we have an approval from a local authority because of the cost and the fact that you know the DOT right away is DOT's jurisdiction and they have jurisdiction and they're gonna they're gonna allow what they're gonna allow. So um, we we typically it is fairly typical for us not to apply for a DOT access permit until we have a local approval. Um, for you know, cost to the applicant and the fact that if we don't get the, the approval, then we never file anything with DOT. So, just to, I, I, that was the first half of your question about why we didn't do it earlier. That that's that's why, and in this case, that was you know coordinated with the applicant, and that's you know it, it was part of the the decision that was made by the project team, and it, and it it is fairly common for something of this magnitude that is you know. In terms of overall developments that we're, we deal with are, are not large. You know, we're, we're not talking about a signalized intersection or anything like that. That you might need to start that process earlier. Um, uh, we did have some, and I believe the woman who stood up mentioned a, a verbal communication that I mentioned in the planning board. And um, we we do have a lot of verbal communications with DOT on a lot of things. Um, we work with District One a ton on uh, on other projects, so. That was probably what she was referencing, but as you mentioned, that the, the access permit you do have the final access permit in your package. So, right, mm -hmm. and I understand that, but I guess my question is, if it if it's if you knew you were going to have to go for an access permit because of a change of use, um, I guess I'm it. I was kind of taken by surprise when I because I did listen last night to the meeting, and I was surprised mm -hmm. that if you have these unofficial discussions with DOT that that you would have cons had a little better plan and knowledge of what DOT was going to ask when you came before the original planning board and the original board of selectmen. Uh, I was just surprised that you wouldn't have had those verbal discussions ahead of time because it is a substantial change and it seems like the only thing that really drove this, it appeared uh, without your explanation that the only thing that drove this was the fact that you had a problem in Lenox with the land that um, that's in Lenox, and if you hadn't had this problem with the issue in Lenox, that nothing would have changed. And that that appeared to be um, my understanding, and, and so I was kind of surprised. And I asked the question before uh, at the last meeting of the board of selectmen, uh, the select board, um, about that issue of that land. I notice on the, uh, the maps that we get, it's still showing the common boundary, common ownership, Z kind of uh, descriptor on the plan, which generally lets the tax assessors know that it's common ownership. Um, <clears throat> but I, I guess I, I, I'm a little confused with the whole process of dividing that property and maybe this goes back to another individual and not you, um, is to exactly, you're saying that it's under, it's under the same control, but it's under two different entities. And I'd like an expl a little better explanation on that so that I understand um, what is meant by that and what the, who the two entities are and what the structure is on this so that I understand why 
why this is happening because I think this has this is part of the problem of coming so late in the game and making these changes. So if somebody there Pete. could explain that, yeah, yeah. Peter. Yeah, uh, Pete might have to. Sure. You're gonna have to take. I don't. I don't know that. Yeah. Yeah. Don't and that's Pete, fine. I, I can. That. Yeah. Do my best to address that. Um, Thank you. So, I, I think you know respectfully we're we're making a, a fairly large um, discussion out of the Lee Lennox town line, but I think it's important to note that on the original submittal application to the select board for the special permit and to the planning board for the site plan review with without exception the lee lennox town line was depicted on that site plan that that was then that was there then yep that's there now mm -hmm. um it's been surveyed so that we are 100 percent confident as to the accuracy of it lennox the town of lennox does not allow cannabis use in this zone so the planters are to ensure that no one is trespassing onto the Lennox land. Um, it, it's an accommodation to ensure that that doesn't occur. Um, but, you know, respectfully, in a way, it's, it's almost a moot point. It was always, the, the line was always there. And, 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 you know, we brought up that it's late in the game. That, that was in the first submittal on the first day that this ever came before any person in the town of Lee with, and without exception. So we structured, um, so that the only thing that's occurred since that, that line was on the map from day one is that we um, surveyed it to ensure its accuracy and it, it actually didn't move in, in any appreciable way. The line's in the same place it was before, but it's now been surveyed. And they split off the land um, the, the owners split off the land so that there's no confusion amongst the towns um, that they are separate and apart and they're not considered one uh, item. And we, we discussed this uh, again at the special permit hearing in great detail when a Lennox resident raised the question and my answer then was the same answer I'll give you now which is we were only seeking approval from the Lee Select Board for the t for the land uh, by map and lot number that was contained in Lee, and the, and the chairman at the time acknowledged that, and that's all a matter of, of record at the public hearing. Um, so we were very clear on this point um, from the first day of the first submittal all the way through the public hearing and all the way through the approval issued by the Select Board. Um, so I, I understand. Um, the interest, I guess, but I, I just want to be clear with this board um, that this was, uh, I, I don't even think disclose is the right word. It was, it was shown on the map. It was discussed at the public hearing. We addressed this question that the Lee Select Board in no way, shape, or form was giving approval for anything in Lennox and that we weren't, weren't seeking approval from the Lee Select Board in Lennox and, and we're not seeking approval tonight from the Lee Select Board for anything in Lennox. Um, and the chairman acknowledged that, and he recognized that they didn't have, you know, any, you know, they weren't they weren't taking any action relative to that land. So the land is there. Uh, every piece of property in Lee has a piece of property next to it that belongs to somebody else uh, that's not part of the project that's before the board for that property. So um, I don't know how much. Uh, I, I, I'm just trying to be super clear on this point because we have been very consistent on this. Uh, from day one and the public has reviewed it, viewed it, discussed it. It was part of the public hearing. I think that, you know, getting back to what's before the board tonight was um, the special permit relative to the, to the use has, has been issued and um, we have complied with all the conditions or will comply depending on which conditions they are relative to the special permit. So I think what's before the board today is um, and the plan now reflects the mass dot um, access and, and how that's been amended. Um, that's what's before the board. The scope of the decision, as I understand it, uh, based on all the conversations I have, is limited solely to the only change, uh, which is the access, um, which we went before the planning board to discuss last night. 
So I, I hope that answers the question. Um, but there's not a lot of new information here outside of, uh, actually there's no new information here outside of the MassDOT uh, now depicting, excuse me, now depicting the MassDOT access. And I think just to bring in a couple of points from last night, uh, the, the original traffic study as presented during the public hearing originally has not changed and, and will not change as, as a result of this access. It was, as Dan mentioned last night, it was based on um, a single exit and entry, um, and there are no required changes to the, spec to the uh, traffic study that was presented and evaluated by this board, not these board members, but by this board previously. Um, so I thought that was an important point that Dan made to the planning board last night that I'd also, you know, just be, be mindful of. And so when we, you know, I think the reason that the planning board took the position that this is a minor change is that all of the documentation up until this point, including all of the engineering uh, drawings and reports and traffic studies, all contemplated what you have before you. The only thing you didn't have before you was was literally the placement of the curb cut. Um, but the traffic studies, the public hearing, the town line, all of those things were part of the original submittal and the original special permit. Here. And I just offer that for the board's consideration. As, as to why we think this is a, a minor change. So I, I, and, and we're also not requesting any changes to the conditions or any amendment to the conditions or any stipulations to that. I mean, we're, you know, none of that's changed, quite frankly. Thank you. Um, I understand that. And uh, as a board member on the planning board at the time, I absolutely agree that we knew that there were two parcels, one in Lee and one in Lenox. That's never been an issue with me. Anyway, I know it's an issue for you guys, and that's one reason you had to carve that piece off in Lennox. So my question is, could on, on the way to get there, I want to understand, because the, the stamped drawing surveyed map by Fuss and O'Neill still shows common ownership. Z, and when you look at a subdivision plan or a or, or a site plan, and you see a boundary with what looks like a big Z through it, it means it's common ownership. Mm -hmm. The issue is, it's no longer common ownership. It may be under separate control, so could you tell me who owns the Lee part and who owns the Lennox part, as far as what entity it, name is? Uh, I, I don't have the entity name in front of me. I don't know, if Dan, if you're able to pull that up quickly, but... Um, Cassandra, who is who is on this call with us, um, mm -hmm. is the owner uh, for Sweetgrass and is also sure. the owner for the other parcels. It's the so, same owner. Uh, well, eventually, but there's a different entity. So I guess my question is, why did Fuss and O'Neill keep the common Z on the boundary line, number one? Yeah. When in fact, it's, if it's a separate entity, I just want to know... What's going on? Because I still have a problem with the fact that you waited to go to DOT. And, and this may end up being a minor change. But the issue is, I want to know why you waited so long unless somebody just didn't think this through, or if somebody would just admit to that and say, we didn't think it through, that there would be a problem with Lennox. Okay, I get that. Um, and that that's why you had to go to DOT, because it seems like change in use itself, I, I don't see how that warranted a DOT change. Uh, it's such, if uh, it almost sounded like your uh, traffic study showed that there would almost be less traffic in some times when the restaurant would have been open. Um, so I just, I'm just trying to wrap my mind around the, how you guys got here. And then I do have some recommendations if we're going to find this is a, a minimal change to the to the plan. I do have some uh, possible and additional comment to make based on what I heard at the planning board meeting last night. So anybody, I, I mean, if this has been registered, I can answer, but, the, yeah. I can answer the technical sure. question sure, thank you. about the, so yeah, let me just hit on the technical question. Sure. Thanks. So the map that we, that we're showing, mm -hmm. um, we had a sub consultant do the survey work. Okay. So the base map for our design, was taken at the time that they finalized that. You know, uh, okay. they went out and actually surveyed and verified the exact location of the town line there. Mm -hmm. 
and that's what's reflected in the background of our of our surveys that most recent updated survey um, and at that time that was uh, I'm not sure exactly how many months ago but it was you know within the last year um, that survey subconsultant prepared the subdivision documents and took care of that directly for uh, for our clients and that work has been done it was not done directly by Fuss and O'Neill and um, we did not update our survey base map to remove I, I see the symbol you're talking about and I didn't see it until you started talking about it and now yeah. I, I definitely see it so I understand the confusion and it's really it's because the last survey we got from our subconsultant was the new line or the you know the, the line yeah. As right. Pete said, didn't change, um, but in the survey world, I think it might have changed by you know a couple of tenths here, here and there, mm -hmm. um, not perceptible to the you know, in terms of a plan. But um, so we uploaded a new base map to our system, and that's what we were using for this. So it, it in terms of this plan, it is a drafting. Uh, it's really a drafting issue. So um, that's why it looks like that. But the work was done by our service sub consultant and done directly for the client. And that work was was performed. The subdivision was done, and it was filed in the land records. I know uh, Pete. If you have more information on that, I know uh, at the no, time no, I believe no, it was Gutlow Gun and Associates. I believe did the work. Um, did, so, did the work. So uh, this is so filed. One other one other important thing that uh, Gordon had raised that that I think we really got to make sure is clearly addressed. Uh, he had raised that. He, he didn't think um, that a, a change in, because you're right, our traffic study does show that at times our traffic is less than that of a, a restaurant. Um, but he raised the question. Yeah, in the morning peak the, hour, this traffic is less. That's correct. Yep. Right. Yeah, but Dan, uh, he raised the question is, did the simple change of use, does that action in and of itself require the MassDOT access permit submittal? Which I understood that you said it did, but but he asked that specifically. I just wanted you to address that. You know, I, I believe that that's what drove us. I know at the time that was, um, you know, Steve Severi was leading that. And yes, it was, and my understanding was the change in use um, was what is what drove us to apply for the permit. Mm -hmm. All right. If um, I don't mean to have the questions here or anything. No. Uh, okay. Yeah. I, I don't mean to. I, I have more questions. Oh, no. I don't good. want to cut anybody out. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm listening. Uh, all right. No problem. Um, so uh, if we are uh, having listened last night to what was going on, I, I understand. And um, the comments about it being safer and whatnot. Um, I did not listen to the very end of their conclusion and vote. Was... Um, if we are going to go down this road and say that it's a modern modification, there are a couple things I'd like done. One is, I think this needs to get refiled, number one, with the Registry of Deeds without that common boundary line on there, because if that's what got recorded, it's incorrect. If there are two separate entities, that needs to be removed. If it's two different entities, and that's why I'm asking, who owns it? What's the name of the company? that owns the part in Linux, and what's the name of the company that owns in Lee? Do we have an answer to that before I go to the next step? The, um, well, Sweetgrass owns Lee, okay. and uh, same people, as I mentioned, and the yeah. Lennox um, land is Laurel Street Annex is the name of the entity, okay. same people. All right, and that's that's been recorded at the Registry of Deeds. Was this form through the Form A and a &R process, or? Or just no, it was. filed deed, okay. Yeah, right. just filed deed okay. uh, because it um, didn't create a new property line, so it didn't. Well, it did. Property. If you have a different entity, you just subdivided it and sold it off to a different entity, didn't uh, you? I, I don't know. The, uh, the, the, the the surveyors did all the work and all the reporting of all the um, the paperwork with the registry. All right. Well, we can follow the up survey. that later with the town's attorney to see how how that can work without an A and R. Um, plan going before the planning board. So if we uh, get by that part and we just look at the entry exit, having listened to your, I won't put you through it all again, uh, having listened to all the discussion about the traffic flow and in and out and lines, I would ask you, because I didn't listen to the very final discussions, um, my thoughts at the time were that this needs to be well marked as far as 
um, where a stop line is if there was you know uh, at before cars to enter out into the uh, DOT right away uh, almost like you're coming to an intersection with a stoplight where you have a line that goes across and then also I would think that we would need to require uh, for to keep it less confusing is to have another stripe just like when you're coming up to a, a light on a two-way road where you have a divider line between the in and the out that's at least uh, car length or 20 to 22 feet back from the street so that you make it very clear what entry exit lines people are to use. Do you follow what I'm saying? Yep, I completely follow and I, I agree. Um, I, I think that if we were going to make this recommendation that it's a minor change, that um, that, that has to be part of the requirement, that we have those lanes very distinctly marked um, for the in, for the ingress and the egress. I did also mention uh, listen to the board last night where they believed that you should have an enter sign and an exit sign. I would also, if I choose to make a motion to do this, that would be part of it. That to, just to make it very clear, uh, maybe even an arrow painted in the lane for the in and the out. It doesn't have to go left and right and all that, just an out arrow on the ground and in arrow on the ground plus your exit and entry signs. Um, so at this moment, I, those are my comments if, if we were to go forward with this. Um, based on the recommendation that it's a minor change from the planning board. I'll leave it up to mm -hmm. you guys if you have more comments or questions. Huh? I'll be quiet. And if we could, Mr. Chairman, just address that. Dan, I think we, we spoke about these driveway markings um, maybe in less detail, but similar similar last night, and, and we agreed those were all things that we would be able to facilitate, correct? There's no... Issue. Yeah, that, that's correct. Yeah, that was brought up last night, and I, I, I agree it would, it's appropriate and a, a good idea to, to put them here. So, And I agree having the arrows on the pavement is also a good idea and would agree to add that. So. A center line, and as well as the stop bar and the entry and exit arrows. I agree. And then, um, Mr. Chairman, to, to Gordon's point on the filing with the registry, the previous decision from the select board did not include a reference to a site plan or a filing with the registry of deeds. So we would, um, and, and he had indicated at the last meeting he'd like to see that. We certainly are more than agreeable to include the uh, site plan with the common ownership symbology removed and file that as part of uh, the special permit with the registries. Uh, certainly that's something we would accommodate and do right away. Yeah, we would appreciate Thanks. that. Yeah, in fact, it's a necessity. I don't know how a special permit can get issued without a document being referenced and filed at the registry, but it's going to have to be this time uh, if, yeah, we, if we, we go that way. Easily, yeah, we can easily fix that. That's no problem. Okay, Bob, do you have anything further? No. Gordon? Um, just as, as a, uh, a matter of record, what we're discussing here tonight is a reconfiguration of the entrance, correct. not of the permit itself. That's correct. Right. It, it's to say that the site plan modification that they want to make is a, right. uh, you know, a de minimis change to the overall permit. Right. It doesn't change since the parking spaces meet and none of the other substantive issues as far as the original permit goes has changed. This is specific in my mind right. to site plan okay. and, and, and unfortunately I can't address the other issues. Right. Um, um, but I acknowledge them but I can't, I don't see a way that we can address that and tie it to this particular issue at hand. And, and this, this um, entry exit reconfiguration is yeah. driven by mass dot correct from the response when they applied for a um what was the what was the terminology uh, change of use, change issue, uh, change uh, of use access permit, access yeah, permit. Access, right. yeah, i just I, I just find it hard to believe that anyway i won't go down that road <clears throat> yeah so um so. so if there's nothing further i'd entertain a motion for approval of the administrative change. Well, I'll, I'll make a motion to make a finding that this is a de minimis change in the overall uh, special permit 
with uh, by reconfiguring the entry, but also in addition that the applicant has to file a plan. And are you going to revise, have a new revision date on this? All right. That's correct. You're going to have to get back to us with a revision date so that we yeah. can yeah. do it by your well, revision can date. Can we agree? Can we, we can agree to a date if that would, if that would be if you would do that amenable please. to the, board, to the sure. board, yeah. So yeah. give me a date. Could, could uh, how soon could you have it ready? We meet in What's two weeks. We well, you guys have it stamped. Yeah. It's your Fuss and O'Neill stamp. Not yeah, the all we're removing, just so I'm clear, we're, the, all, all, the only change is that we're removing the shared ownership symbology. And the, adding the arrows yep, to the stop yeah, bar. I'd, I'd like it all to be shown as a site plan change. Yep. The okay. line delineation, so, the arrows, and the exit, two, just put an exit and entry sign that, that comply with our signage for directional signage under our bylaw. Yep. Mr. And Chairman, what's the date? The date of your next meeting? We could just we could agree to utilize that date. That's what I was. That, that's that what I was true? wondering. Uh, I believe it's December sixth. The sixth. Yeah. Does that the work December sixth? And I'd like it here so we can review it. And we can. Yes. All right. So. So we. I have a motion mm -hmm, at yeah. this point. Um, with all that, with all those, um, I believe there was kind of three major, major points, maybe four. Removal of the common uh, sign, uh, signification there, driveway markings and entry and exits, um, any signage required. And, and a date on a new and plan. a date on a new those. plan. So um, that, so the motion was uh, for approval of, of the as administrative a, change yeah, as a minor change. As a minor change. Um, to the special permit with those conditions. There was a refiling with just a Yeah, you'll have lot. to re you'll have to refile and, and it's to refile the December sixth plan once we look at it and, and uh, make sure that everything's on it. So it's just showing the leaf portion and yeah. not Lennox. Yeah, we don't need the Lennox leaf. part on there. And I'm not concerned about your temporary planters. I'm not concerned about that. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll certainly follow that plan. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I don't know that you need to put a condition, but in either case, if we'll, we'll do it. Uh, you no, I want it as that. a. I want it as a condition. I want it back here, and Perfect. I want to see it. Um, that would be. That's my motion. Is there a second? I'll second. So um, at this point, if there's no further discussion, Bob Gordon, uh, hearing none. All those in favor. Uh, Gordon Bailey, aye. Bob Jones, aye. Sean Renier, aye. Um, so, thank you for coming, Sweetgrass, um, and we will see you again, I'm sure. And, and we will wait. Just so I'm clear, uh, we just need to get the updated plan to Chris, correct? Yeah, I think if you just got it to Chris, that would suffice. Can we, he can cir it. Yeah. circulate it. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for the discussion. Thank you. Have a good night. Have a good night. Yep, thank you. You also. Our next order of business, we have BCAC weatherization ARPA request, and this is the Berkshire Community Action Council. Do we have somebody from Jesse? That's right. I forgot earlier. We talked about this. Jesse. Yes. Can you hear me? You're great. Hi. Go ahead. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Can you all hear me okay? Yeah, loud and clear. All right. Thanks so much for allowing me to zoom in and join you tonight um, and just giving a little bit of time so I can explain this project. My name is Jesse Cooley, so I'm working with Berkshire Community Action Council. They Their service area is all of Berkshire County, so um, it does include households in Lee. And this project is specifically working with their weatherization team. Um, hopefully you received the, the handout which broke down a little bit of the project. I'll just give a brief overview and then a little more details on residents of Lee who are waiting for this support for weatherization and then I'll answer any questions you might have. 
Um, but basically, we're trying to solve a problem here that really exists across the state and across the country with uh, people who are facing roadblocks to receiving free weatherization and home heating system benefits. So it's free for people who are already on fuel assistance, who are income eligible. So this means we are working with people who are senior citizens, people who um, are low income with young children, people who have disabilities, um, and again, specifically in Berkshire County in our case. So we find that when our weatherization team goes out and performs energy audits for people, um, similar to what Mass Save does, but this is specifically through BCAC for people um, with low income, about one in three energy audits will, will come back with um, determination that the, the resident does need weatherization services um, to, to conserve energy in their home, to bring down their heating costs, you know, for their own health and safety, um, and, and for the housing stock to be strong. But they need some kind of other readiness project completed first. So the readiness projects that would have to be done before they can receive the free weatherization assistance are things like roof leaks or um, switching over old wiring. Knob and tube wiring is very common in Berkshire County, so that's the most common roadblock. Um, for instance, to explain why that's an issue, if you have not been tube wiring, you cannot have your walls insulated. It's a major fire hazard. So in order to get free insulation that's provided by the state and utility companies, the, the resident or homeowner would first have to switch over that electrical work. And that's very expensive. Other ones are moisture or mold in the house um, or heavy storage. So a lot of times that's due to people with hoarding disorder. Not always though, it can be elderly residents that have too much stuff in the attic and they're not physically capable of clearing it out. So the contractor can't get into that space to uh, fix, you know, fix the roof or insulate the attic. Um, so we find that hundreds of homeowners and, and residents across the county are facing this challenge and they've been on a wait list. We've had a wait list that's been accumulating for years and there isn't enough funding for these readiness projects. And I've been working on this now for uh, many months and the team at BCAC longer, a lo lot longer than that, trying to find funding wherever we possibly can. So we're working with our state legislative delegation, we're working with um, Senator Markey's team and others at the um, federal level. There is a lot of money for weatherization services, which you might be aware of, but the problem is not all of it is also for these readiness projects. So there's an eligibility issue with a lot of the funding, and then there's also just an overall um, amount issue. You know, there's never quite enough funding for these types of projects. So the challenges are, though, if, if we just let people stay on the wait list forever and we don't tackle the project and, and help them get these weatherization services, um, it's unsafe often because they just can't heat their home. So they're, they're cold. They might be using their oven for heat or a space heater in one room and trying to stay warm that way. Um, and there can be just sort of a disrepair, like the home, it kind of becomes a ripple effect and that really hurts the housing stock in the community. So that's another motivation to try to fix these, um, these issues. And the utility companies do provide some funding. Um, it can be typically two to $5,000 per home per project. So we're looking for supplemental funding wherever we can find it. And some towns are have already appropriated or are considering appropriating some of their ARPA funding specifically for this purpose. Um, just to explain how that would work, how it is working, when towns decide, some towns also appropriate through their annual budget, they have a line item um, that is passed in, in town meeting with uh, a small amount of town funds annually that can be used for this purpose. And if that is, whenever that is done and approved by the town and the town leaders, the money is um, held at BCAC in a separate fiduciary account, specifically for residents only of that town. So no one in the town has to coordinate these projects. They don't know which residents need it. So it's it doesn't place any extra burden on anybody in the town leadership, so that's important to note. Um, the weatherization team at BCAC has the list of people who are waiting for these projects to get done. So if there's funding allocated just for that town, they can draw down on that, complete the project, and then just send a report back to the town each year or more often if they request it, saying this is how many people in your town 
or helped with that funding. We could even say which what projects were completed, but it wouldn't um, include any personal information that would identify the residents of the, the town that received that support. Um, and we have about 18 families on the list in Lee currently, so it's been, again, accumulating over the last several years. And it's a, a variety of people um, facing issues, as I mentioned, knob and tube, other structural issues, some of them have asbestos or vermiculite that needs to be remediated, heavy storage, electrical. So there's a number of issues. Um, and I could give you more specifics on that, but um, I'll stop now just to answer any questions that have already popped up, because I know I've been talking kind of quickly. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, so I guess, you know, there's a couple different numbers here. Uh, how much uh, would you be looking for the town to uh, contribute? Mm -hmm. Well, it really depends on what, uh, <laughs> you know, what your total is that you have or what's available still, because um, I know a lot of ARPA funds have already been appropriated for other important projects in the community, and that has been true across the county, of course, so it really it does depend on how much you feel you have um, because the truth is the list is going to keep growing you know this is the season when more people are signing up for fuel assistance more energy audits are going to be completed therefore more of these projects are going to be identified as a need so I will say that uh, the need will probably be ongoing uh, for several years and as as much as your community feels like they can contribute uh, BCAC would be able to use directly to to start helping uh, families complete these projects. If I were to stay, I did a little bit more digging, looking at the 18 that we currently have on the list, um, seeing what the actual challenges are, looking at other issues such as availability of contractors. You know, there's a lot of different factors here and how quickly projects can be completed anyway. Um, so if we were to look at, for instance, about seven or eight of the people on the list, those are more like ready to go, we could probably tackle them much more quickly than the entire list. The average cost of these projects is six to ten thousand dollars. We would be seeking at least five thousand, up to five thousand from the utility companies. So in order to tackle those seven, the supplemental funding would be um, possibly around thirty or thirty-five thousand dollars. So that's a number I could throw out there, but like I said, we would make use of less than that. We would make use of more than that. It is kind of flexible in that way. We, we still have a rather good chunk of money in ARPA funds, right, Chris? It was about? Uh, a little over 117,000. Yeah, 000. okay, 117, that's right. One of the things we had talked about originally when I met with, um, with Jesse was that um, some towns are doing it on a yearly basis mm -hmm. through um, and I think, Jesse, correct me if I'm wrong, but most of them in the area are in the five to 10,000 range a year out of town meeting um, to yes. continue to, to not build up a, 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 a backlog of, of places. So um, that is something we could consider in the warrant, similar to what we do for other. Yeah, I think know, that's not a bad idea. Um, so this could, yeah. this could address, and actually the reason why this came a little sooner is as some towns have done ARPA. Um, and it led several residents to calling and saying, "Is Lee have any ARPA because we heard, you know, this town mm -hmm. or that town was. Right. Um, and while we can't give the resident that ARPA money, um, we can give it to BCAC who can then distribute that. So, um, mm -hmm. so by doing this now could get some projects, some priority projects started and then if the town chooses that town meeting to mm -hmm. add 5,000 a year to you know, that could be something we could look at um, down the road, so. Yeah, I'm, I'm for, uh, I think the 35,000 is more than reasonable. I'm for, uh, I'm definitely for that. Um, Bob, Gordon, you guys have any questions? So we do the 35,000 and then put something on the we, warrant? Or, or we could do more, or we could do. Yeah, so that whatever is on the warrant would be available at the beginning of the next fiscal year. Mm -hmm. So what, what we do now could get projects between now and and July 1st, and then anything on the warrant could continue that um, for the next six months, or well, next 12 months after that. Yeah. But. Right. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, so yeah, I guess 
I'd entertain a motion at this point. If you're okay with the 30, 35, I'll, I'll make a motion that uh, we earmark $35,000 of ARPA money for BCAC for the, their projects. Yeah. Uh, I'll second it with discussion. Um, you wanted to, I have a motion and a second. Further discussion, yeah, Gordon? Yeah. No, just a quick question, Chris. Uh, my math shows me that that leaves us with 82000 in ARPA money, and I know that you said there's more money coming if it ever gets through the legislature on the second round ARPA money. That, that's, that's including both rounds. We have received that. Oh, yeah. yeah so, so that's no longer a that wait. Means, so we've got it. That's and the 82 would be the final okay. balance, yeah. So what are other things? Just, just trying to yeah. prioritize. Yeah. What are other things that might be coming before us um, that, that maybe they've applied to we don't know about them yet? Yeah, so I haven't had any other requests at this okay. point. Um, we have all of the items that are on here. Uh, more About half of the money has been put into water and sewer infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, we have used some of it already with um, the bullseye yes. um, project. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. We did some work with uh, some, some donations to some other nonprofits, yeah. uh, Green Agers, who did some of our parks, um, and a couple other nonprofits. We did some to the community garden. There was some direct money for COVID testing and Tri Town Health. Um, um, just kind of trying to summarize the list, but. Uh, Anybody we the, that we haven't spent yet that we're considering putting out there that. Hasn't been committed. I won't yeah, so there's 117,000 uncommitted then, right okay. now. Then mm -hmm. you don't have any, okay. Nothing else Let's committed, sure. sure. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. that was, I just yeah. wanted to make sure there were other, other things that, uh, mm -hmm. that maybe we have to weigh this against, but I don't have a problem. If this gets seven projects moving, then That's great. more power to them. Yeah. And if they can't get the contractors, then I can easily wait till our next town meeting to see how the townspeople feel about you know, putting money toward this, I, I have no problem with that. Okay. Bob? Uh, there's no more discussion. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, okay. Jesse. Right, wow, thank you all so much. I'm really um, excited to share the news with BCAC and know that hopefully then by the time the town meeting process happens, we'd already be able to report on, you know, some successful okay. project completion. So. Um, I'll stay in touch with you, and again, thank you so much for the support. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, our next order of business is we have a Colonial Power Municipal Aggregation presentation. We have three people here tonight. Right. Uh, Thanks for thank being Thank you so much patient. for your patience. We appreciate it. Uh, Mark, uh, Joseph, and Denise are here from Colonial Power. We discussed a little bit. Yeah. Um, I gave them a little overview. Um, but I'm sure you can do a much better <laughs> job than I did of the municipal aggregation um, process. So. Mark Capitone, my Colonial Power, 5 Mount Royal Ave, Marlboro. Uh, thank you for having us. Sure. So we, we're, we're going to be discussing municipal aggregation tonight, our community choice uh, power supply. And this, is, this has to do with, with your Eversource bill and just the supply portion of the bill. And I'll start with kind of a process. Uh, process is fairly simple, but it, it does have a couple of hurdles that need to be uh, taken. We need to accept the statute at town meeting, whenever that might be. And after that happens, the process is fairly simple from that point forward. It's simply create a plan, hang a plan, 30, 30 business days it has to be hung, and then after that, this board would vote on that plan. And then the, the real fund comes. That means we get into the state process. That means we go to the DOER. That's simply a consultation. It normally takes about four to six weeks. And then we take all of this information, we put it together in a filing, uh, and we file it with the Department of Public Utilities. What does that mean? That means it's a black hole right now for about 24 to 36 months they're taking to turn these programs around. There's some good news on that. Um, this is gonna be an administrative ch uh, change. And maybe they're going to, uh, they're certainly going to put some new appointments in place. Whether or not that speeds up municipal aggregation, I'm not certain. What does it mean to the end user? Really no change, just a choice that hasn't been there. So this current winter, um, believe it or not, uh, just today, uh, the rates for Eversource were published. So they're around 22 cents a kilowatt hour. 
Um, this would give you a, a, a choice that, that you don't have this winter. So the town's plan is just something that someone can choose. The hot button item, it's an opt-out aggregation. So what does that mean? Everyone in town that's on basic service would get a mailing prior to the program starting. They'd have a choice to make. If they do nothing, they'd automatically be enrolled. So again, it's opt-out. And it, that has a lot of energy benefits to it so that we can price things correctly and so forth. What does it mean to the end user? Really no change. Meaning, there's still, there's just a single line item change on your bill. So when the program finally went through all that process, we would actually go out to bid and we'd get a price. I'm just gonna put an ember out there. Um, I'll use, uh, I think, uh, I'll use Pittsfields. That might be the closest ever source. I think they're at like nine, eight. So at the, your program's at nine or 10 cents a kilowatt hour. There'd be a, an apples to apples comparison that the, the consumer would have so it's called a consumer notification form. They would be able to look at it, and at this time, we would, you know, there'd be a mailing, 10 cents compared to 22 cents. If you don't do anything, you're automatically enrolled at 10 cents. If they're part of any distribution company program, budget billing, automatic uh, withdrawal, uh, uh, a uh, consumer discount, uh, you know, low income, fixed income, those kind of uh, um, issues, they all stay in place. Those are all distribution company programs, and those programs stay in place. So there's, there's no real change on that side, on the, on the user side of things. Meaning, this program is a, a commodity program, it's the electron running through the wire. Power goes out, you call National Grid, issue, with, I mean, excuse me, Eversource, <laughs> problem with your bill, you call Eversource. So it, from, from that standpoint, it, it's really, it's a, a simple process. From your standpoint, what does it require from you? No tax dollars, no, no ads to staff, none of those things. It's simply ma making decisions. Someone's going to have to have the authority to sign off on uh, contracts and you know, finally a supply contract between the town and, um, and the citizens. That's how it works. You bring your citizens to market, they make a decision whether they want to participate or not. I'll say that there's 15 communities in the Berkshires currently um, participating in these programs and <laughs> very fortunate that they had been out prior to this giant run up. So it, it was a good time for aggregation. Certain communities though, some of their contracts were a little bit um, shorter than others. You know, all that flexibility is there. So th they have some increases coming as well. Mm -hmm. That's truly aggregation 101. I really wanted to get questions from you um, so that I can make sure that it's all clear. Yeah, I think we have a few for sure. Um, I think it, part of the struggle for me is um, potentially getting the 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 large increase in a rate all at once, rather than because you know if we if we locked in a power uh, kilowatt per hour at a low rate, and then all of a sudden you know our contract goes out and we got to renegotiate, it's going to hit everybody all at once, right? So that's whereas it doesn't change any. Thing in the billing, I could see that kind of being a sticker shock point for some people, you know, to yeah. get some pushback from it, that. And, and here's, here's the good news. So we all have that in Eversource right now, every six months, just because of winter and summer pricing. So for the next couple of winters, we have a little issue here in Iso New England where we're short on natural gas, mm -hmm. if you will. So we're going to see these, not like this winter, I hope, <laughs> but this is our, our largest. But, you're, you know, you're probably seeing a 30 plus percent increase, you can take those shocks out. You can go, your contracts can be 30, 36 months, 24 months, 18 months, just depends right. on the curve. That's what I was gonna ask next is, what, what's like the typical duration of these contracts, right? Is it anywhere from that, yeah, in that range? It, it really depends on the market. Right now mm -hmm. we would go short, we're at historic highs. We, we, we don't believe that we wanna buy any extra fear than we needed to. But just two years ago we were at historic lows so 36 or you know 40 month contracts were not unusual because you know that's one of the things most people don't understand. <laughs> Eversource doesn't do anything on your behalf, whether the price is good or bad. Two years ago, they didn't buy extra; they can't. It's, it's, it's a, a mandate, yeah. mm -hmm. so they're never they're not managing it. They're just managing a process. Right. There are some decisions I'm certain they would have made, <laughs> you know, knowing what the situation was, but they're not allowed to make those, and and that's in in part to make you go out and shop. Mm -hmm. And in my opinion, municipal aggregation is one of the tools, probably the only tool for the residential and low income, uh, not low income, but uh, small commercial uh, customers 
you and I don't really have a choice in the marketplace. Large industrials have, I don't know if, if Lee does this, but you're probably out on your town buildings and schools and those kind of yeah. things right now and have been saving money for a long time. All of that being said, this program turns the tables on the suppliers. So we're saying, it, us, Lee, we're, we're willing to bring our customers to the table with a free opt-out, a free opt-in, those kind of things. There's no fees, there's no penalties, it's all consumer loaded. If you don't want to bid it on it, that's fine. We'll have someone else bid on it. But we don't have to deal with their terms and conditions. These are our terms and conditions. So much different than what's going on in the marketplace right now with third-party supply. Mm -hmm. Okay. Chris, did you? Oh, I was just going to just to clarify. And you can opt out anytime. Yes. Correct. So, yes. Yeah. So, so if somebody wanted to opt out before the program, that's not a problem. They could always get back in six months later. They realize, okay, this isn't a problem. Or six months later, the the price is uh, for uh, Eversource is below. They could opt out there, and then six months later, opt back in if they wanted to. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing, can you talk just real briefly about the RECs? Because um, the board uh, or the town would have some options as to what kind of REC credits we want uh, absolutely. You know, in there. And that would affect the overall price as well, right? That, exactly. So think of it this way, just kind of a layering effect. Basically, you'd have your RPS, that's a, a renewable portfolio standard. You have to have that in Massachusetts. It's let's just call it 51% renewable right now, 2023. So on top of that, you could add any color green you wanted. You know, the gold standards like a mass class one or S rec, those kind of things have seen more, but there's other economical um, vehicles that you could use to um, green up your load, a national wind product, a main hydro product, all of that's gonna be available to you so that you could have, the big deal is when wherever you move everyone, that's where most of the people stay, but you could say, Hey, for a little bit more, I can add, you know, a 5% or 10% more mass class ones, have the ability to opt down for people on fixed income, low income. And then if somebody wanted to have a 100% green product, they could opt up to that product as well so that you can address anyone's needs uh, that might be out there in the community. So the community doesn't have to do it as a whole block. Uh, individuals will have the right to manipulate their own agreements within once the town agrees to do this um is that what i'm hearing from you is that individuals can have actually this choice right over their own opt-in that that is a hundred percent correct okay. the, the town has a contract so the, the people that don't do anything will automatically be put in right. but this choice to move in in between the aggregation or or get out of the aggregation so the people, if the town opts to go this way, every individual who gets this notice has the ability to look within their own contract, sub the town's con, I mean, they're under the con, the town's umbrella, but they'd be able to, like you said, opt for more green energy, less green energy, whatever, that is on correct. their own individually without affecting anybody else's rates. That's exactly okay. correct. Thank you. You're welcome. I just one clarification no contract with the town right the town signs a contract on behalf of all the residents this gotcha. is just a notification okay, okay. gotcha mm -hmm. great do you have any anything further bob no so what's the step that we have to take if we want to go down this route the first is to put on the town warrant we have to and have accept the statute it. right Exactly. Yes. Right. Okay. Which I believe I've given you. Credit. Yeah. Yep. So I think it, yeah, this is yep. in the packet. Mm -hmm. um, we would need to put this on our warrant for the next town meeting. Correct. Um, and then. And, and my understanding is that um, we don't have to put this out for an RFP or anything. Once we adopt this, we can pick somebody to just go with. We don't have to. It is 30 to be exempt. Yes. That's to me. That, yes. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to get to. Is mm -hmm. just make sure that we don't have to go through yet a year-long procedure to decide to go with somebody. I mean, we can just pick and go. So when this first came out, the county uh, mm -hmm. Colonial Power won the county-wide request for proposal. Okay. So all the all the towns in Berkshire County are mm -hmm. with Colonial, okay. and that process has already been done on behalf of all the towns. So okay. I believe you said there's 15 towns that are doing that. That are 15 are, are currently participating. Right. Okay. And that doesn't expire, that particular issue, so that we don't have to go back out. I mean, right. that's going to be in place for a while? 
Well, that's in place, but it's also 30B exempt anyway. Okay. Anyway. So mm -hmm. anyway, okay. Mm -hmm. All right. And, uh, I'm just trying to figure it out. Okay. All right. So we need to get to town meeting uh, with this concept, and uh, again, we need to get some education out there beforehand. Yeah. Uh, so we'll have to be maybe having them come in for a special meeting to uh, to get everybody in town aware of what's going on. We, you know, we've done it numerous meeting. times. Yeah. Sometimes town meeting itself, if people have questions, we're happy to answer those questions. Make sure that everyone, we firmly believe once people get educated in municipal aggregation, yeah. it wins the day. Okay. Yeah. Sure, because obviously we need you there during town meeting, but I think we need to do education before town meeting. Agreed. Perfectly uh, fine. To the citizens to make them understand what the process is going to be. And I just want to make sure everyone understands, there's no commitment by the town yeah. until you sign a contract. So you accept the statute, we go through the process, we get you a, uh, a you know, a final, a final order out of the Department of Public Utilities. Until a contract is signed, there is nothing moving sure. forward. Just a process that we've, we've done. We've had communities, I think 2016, given this in, yeah. you know, historic high rate for national grid, the, the uh, city of Newburyport finally went from, you know, they've been sitting on an order since 2016, but because of the rate change, they finally acted. I would think. Yes, it, correct. <laughs> with the rate change, I don't know if you're able to answer this, but with the current rate changes going up to the 22 cents per kilowatt, the, the 15 towns in the Berkshires, are they, do you know if they're all paying less than that right now due to this? Uh, they are all okay. paying less. Uh, so most of them, I think the only one that's right there would be Great Barrington, and that was because the contract had ended um, just this this uh, this November. So we're at, we're watching the market, um, and again, if I heard correctly, there's a couple of stray missiles that are not going to help anyone with energy problems that landed in Poland tonight. Yeah. yeah. So um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to get further exacerbated. But almost everyone there uh, signed around two years ago. They're up at the end of next year. And, the, and, and then January of 2024. Mm -hmm. At, in that nine cent range. Okay. Again, it was just a very good time yeah, to buy. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, in the nine, nine to 10 cent range. Correct, just depending on the communities that did this previous, okay. Well, at that time we were at historic lows. So right. I don't think those rates are gonna be out there anymore, Chris. Right. I, you know, I expect them to be slightly higher, but we'll all be subject to them, so. Right. As well as basic service. So when you go to DOER, I know that they have um, new energy codes coming out, and they, they have, um, although we are having a transition governmentally, though, I think that's going to stay, that's, that's pretty well implanted, that we're going to be going as much green as possible. Um, probably more so now. 2030, yeah, probably more so now. Um, so you don't see any problem with them, and, and you're hoping that DPU just gets some new people in there to work a little faster correct uh, I can okay. tell you uh, it's my business so mm -hmm. uh, the the governor-elect has yeah. been a, a tremendous opponent to third-party supply she's trying to shut it down for you and me what I'll call door-to-door -door and individual mailings she'd like to shut that down yeah. she is also a tremendous uh, you know uh, uh, um, a proponent of municipal aggregation okay. she loves it because it gives local control and, and allows you the, the cities and towns to meet your own uh, energy goals. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, yeah. Thanks for the presentation. You're welcome. I think, yeah, <laughs> thank we'll, you very much. You guys are your patient. I'll be in touch with you. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Um, so we'll be looking to put that on the town warrant, I hope. All right. Mm -hmm. um, Seems that way. Our next order of business I have an appointment here um, to the Applica Appalachian Trail Committee, uh, Community Committee, it's a bit of a tongue twister, uh, Trish Johnson, I have um, a letter of interest here, so I'd be looking for a motion for approval. I move we appoint Trish Johnson to the uh, Appalachian Trail Committee. I'll second that. Uh, there's no further discussion. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Question is, is there a limit to, to this or what's or there, not really? <coughs> no, right now it's just an ad hoc committee gotcha. for the application. Okay. Once um, 
the application has been approved and we become that designation, we'll be um, hopefully making that a standing committee. Okay. So, which is part of the one of the conditions of mm -hmm. the to be to be the uh, Appalachian Trail community designation. We'll have to have a, a standing committee, but. Does that mean that we should uh, that we would need to have a vote at town meeting to adjust our corporate bylaw to spell out a number of people or whatever? How how do we work that? Yeah. So once we um, it's probably going to be in another year or so, but okay. it, until we know that we have the designation, sure. but once we do, we would we would want to add that by it. bylaw. Yeah. Great. Okay. Thank you. So and most likely, um, you know, hopefully, most of these people would still be interested in doing mm -hmm. that. So um, they've done a great job so far, and right. the application is in, but I understand there's going to be an interview process and okay. um, some other follow-ups follow before the, um, the designation. And that, I, so we're looking at at least, you know, it, it could be six months to a year before we hear okay. the official results. So possibly by this town meeting, but more likely 23. So. Okay, thank you. Um, next order business, there's a gas permit. Um, this is for the installation of a new gas service at 127 Paul Drive. Looks like I got a dig safe number, competent person, signed by DPW and police department. There's a map here. So, Paul Drive, yep. So this is like all the way at the top there. Mm -hmm. That's so they have to actually, are they going under the road? They're actually digging the I road. I think they, they're hopefully, you know, there's a note here, usually mm -hmm. always is, to attempt to bore all blacktop okay. areas. Great. So that's always the hope, but sometimes it's not possible. Well, if they can bore that, that's a plus for us. Right. Uh, I'd, I'd make a motion that we, that we approve the, um, Installation in the gas service at 127 Paul Drive. I'll second it. Um, there's no further discussion on the gas permit. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Um, I got a couple other things here. Um, firstly, I guess we'll handle this one first. I have a sign permit. Is this? I think this is a. Yeah. Here's, yeah. This is a uh, temporary sign permit. Um, they're asking us to waive the fee. Mm -hmm. This is, they're going to display it here at 25 Park Place, the first congregational church, hanging on the fence in the, in the park. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have a, I have a, we have a, I think we all have, did you guys all see this? Nope. That's going to be the, um, oh, okay. Thank you. I guess I have yeah, a copy. You got it in that. there somewhere. <laughs> okay. Yep. No, it's under, uh, Gotcha. All right. Yeah, so. Um, mm -hmm. It's from the Berkshire Community Diaper Project. Yes, and we did this last year for them, too. Um, allowed them to put their ban. I mean, it's more of a banner than a sign, but. Yeah. It's not. Yeah, it's, it's temporary. Not yeah, it's all temporary, so. Um, yeah, if there's no. Tell everybody how many, what the sign's going to say. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. yeah. So. <laughs> Yeah, yeah this is the Berkshire Community Diaper Project. They're gonna everybody will get a chance to see the sign, but they delivered uh, one and a half million diapers to Berkshire families since 2014. I think that's pretty amazing. Yeah, for people in need, that's, that's an incredible cost savings for for families. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd make a motion to approve the um, uh, the temporary sign. Is there dates? From when to when? There are, I'm sure there is. So dates will be uh, November 18th to December, December 18th. To one month. So it's yeah. about a month. Okay. No, I, I would approve it given those dates. I'll second it. Mm -hmm. And I'll waive the fee. And waive the fee. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I have a motion and a second on the sign permit. Any further discussion? None. Hearing none. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Um, at that, at this point, I don't think I have, unless I'm missing something, I don't have anything else here. Um, 
we can uh, move on to Chris, you, your town administrator report. Yeah, just two quick updates. Um, the I have the rest of river update for this week, which is the eighth and final interim baseline monitoring surface water sampling event will occur at the end of November or December of 2023. Um, and 2023? they will three. That's what it says on the report. But I was yeah. just now that you're saying that, I feel I like it, it might be a typo. Yeah. yeah. But um, we got another notification yeah. too, right? Here. Yeah, yeah. So I've just noticed that as I'm reading okay. it. So it might be 2022. Um, uh, GE will collect surface water samples from eight locations. Uh, EPA will collect split sample from one location for quality control. Um, the sampling results will be used to refine the two-year pre-remediation baseline sampling program scheduled to begin in 2023. So I think that was a typo in the report. Mm -hmm. um, the fourth 2022 quarterly dam inspection for Rising Pond and Woods Pond uh, are scheduled November 21st. Uh, monthly manual groundwater elevation gauging and quarterly groundwater sampling is being initiated at the UDF this week. Um, GE contractors are conducting bank and sediment sampling in REACH 5A, and, which will be used to help design the remediation plan, and that field work ex is expected to last through the month of November. Um, my other update was uh, just that the Board of Health will be conducting their adjudicatory hearing this Saturday uh, at the high school, 10 a.m. So. Yeah. I have a question on, on the sampling. If the EPA is doing a sort of a keep everybody honest sampling, one out of eight, yeah, I would, I'm surprised that they aren't out of all the samples. They said they were going to do one sample. Correct. Yeah, it says one eight location. locations. Yeah. EPA will collect a split sample from one location. If that would yeah, yeah, I, I kind of, I don't know if we have any input. I'd like to write the EPA and say, hey, uh, one and eight, I don't think that's a very good way to go about the double check and hold their feet to the fire. I'd like to see more than that. And I'm sure they'll well, thank you. What well, would be the big deal? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, well, the big deal? I think that's, I think, yeah, we could do that. I, mean, I think yeah. we should ask and let's yeah. see what kind of feedback we're going to yeah. get. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we're supposed to be uh, able to give input, then that's my input. Is yep. I, I think they need to do more than one sample. Um, for sure, I, I'd like to see them do four samples. Yeah, I was going to say you maybe. Know, to, to start, let's let's start with like making sure that people are doing what they're supposed to do. No offense to the subcontractors that are doing this, but you know, um, let's just let's see if they're uh, EPA. We can take them at their word, where we're uh, we're able to have a, a participate in this and have a dialogue with them. I'd like to see more sampling done uh, by not GE subcontractors. Let's see, let's see what they have to say. So I can reach out to them with I'd that love question. you to. Sure. I'd like you to sure. actually give it to, if, if you don't mind, I'd Absolutely. like to make a recommendation that uh, I'd make a motion that we have Chris send uh, a letter to them saying that the board would like to see, as part of our participation in this, I'd like to see more sampling done independent from GE's contractors overseen by just the EPA. Yeah, well, I'll second that. Well, let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. I, I can, I can, it's okay. well, you know, I know what they did in Pittsfield. Yeah, and, I do too. And, and, and that's, yeah. I don't want to get, I don't want to be like Pittsfield. No, no I, I get Pittsfield, it. But I yeah. don't want to be like that. Yep. I get it. Um, uh, any further discussion on the motion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, and I did want to mention just um, the the second half of what I want to uh, the um, board of health hearing um, for any residents that are looking for information. There's more details on the website. We've added a section right on the main page in the news section um, that has all of the information for the adjudicatory hearing, which includes the posting. Mm -hmm. um, and I believe right now up to 13 or 14 bits of, um, of evidence and uh, that's on there that can be reviewed. Okay. So right. anything um, that anyone's looking for on it, all of the information, all of the letters, all of the correspondence is, is linked to the main site. So, right. And then and again, 10 o'clock uh, Saturday. Yeah.
I think we we can remind people also that this is a this is not a board of health meeting. This is a hearing. It's a, it's a legal procedure. Uh, it's going to they're looking for expert testimony. Uh, we know they're going to be some uh, um, uh, professionals there, educate people who don't know about PCBs, people who know about uh, the site itself, the geologists. Um, but this is not a a regular meeting, so we. We in Lee know know what we're up against. This is the Board of Health. They're looking at at this uh, situation very narrowly. It's just about the site itself and whether it's appropriate for a a dump that's being proposed. So I, my suggestion is I encourage people to come, but I also encourage people to listen and uh, let's let the Board of Health do their work. Thank you. Thanks. Well said, Bob. Um, Chris, if you, if there's nothing further. Um, no, nope. nothing else. Our next uh, meeting is the 6th of December. I'd entertain a motion for to adjourn. So moved. I will second that motion. All those in favor? Aye. Aye.